Welcome to St. Valentine's Church, Loveland, Ohio, on this third Sunday after Trinity. I will now say these things to you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. You are stronger than you know. This is the title of my sermon this morning. Michael Hoff wrote a very famous poem some of you might have already heard. It says, hard times create strong men, strong men create good times, good times create weak men, and weak men create hard times. In the classical Chinese tradition, when a young scholar had finished 18 years of education necessary to take the imperial examination, he had memorized over 30,000 Chinese characters and was able to recite the Confucian four books and five classics by heart. He was called by the master scholar, someone that he had grown to appreciate as a second father, and he was blessed with a black silk hat. This hat was blank. There was nothing on it. The gem that would be placed on his forehead was either a green jade, a red coral, a white onyx, or a black agate based upon his performance, wearing upon his forehead for all to see for the rest of his life how he had done in the examinations. Once this local examination was complete, the Sheng Yuan, or new student, was born. The young scholar would be given his first assignment in public service in an assistant capacity. He attached ribbons to the back of his hat and people would see that he was up and coming. According to the Chinese way of thinking, wisdom was needed for the greater good. Things like farming or mercantile art could be taught from father to son or mother to daughter and did not require such long periods of preparation. The young scholar had to prove his worth by diligently studying and serving all those around him. After eight years of successful service in an assistant position, the now middle-aged scholar would be given another chance to take an examination. This was the examination that was held in the city of the province, only held every three years. If this was passed, the scholar became a xiu cai, or a brilliant talent, and he was gifted houses and lands and positions as a leader in either the local dist district or an assistant within the imperial court system. He would attach ears to his hat like a Mickey Mouse hat, and all the people could see his position within the imperial system. The Imperial Palace held an exam every seven years, and those who had become brilliant talents were eligible for this examination. Normally, it would be taken by men in their 40s and 50s, and corresponds with our doctoral degree today. If they passed this, they were called Jin Shi, or men presented to the emperor. And these men were the governors, high officials, and counselors of the emperor himself. They had square gems of gold, jade, and other precious jewels sewn into their caps and these crown scholars ruled the land as philosopher kings, like in the dialogues of Plato's Republic. The Chinese imperial examination system was an impressive apparatus for governing a large country and remained relatively unchanged for almost 2,000 years. It was stable because it reflected a few important truths understood intuitively by all conservative cultures. One, learning is a lifelong process. Two, Learning needs to happen through practical application and social experience. And three, some of the best learning can be only done in the later years of life. Having an expectation of lifelong learning and growth makes you stronger. Expecting a constant cycle of change and placing yourself in the center of this cycle by grasping that which is eternal and unchanging always makes you stronger. This is moral character. As the cultural axiom states so clearly, when at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Or as Guan Zhong, the teacher to Confucius, so famously said, if your plan is for one year, plant rice. If your plan is for 10 years, plant a tree. If your plan is for 100 years, educate yourself and your children in good character. Today, I want to encourage all of you to learn these lessons, not to see all that you have gone through in the last few years of your education as an ending. Instead, see it as a beginning. This is just the beginning of your life. To both those who have struggled throughout their education and who have not enjoyed the process, and to those of you who have loved being in education and who have prospered and have survived in every capacity, thriving to the best of your ability, I would like to say that this is just the beginning 
of your life. Today is supposed to be one of the most important and satisfying days of your lives. 2020 has been a remarkable year, and all of you will remember this as an ungraduation. And this year, with all of its trials and struggles, will become one of the greatest stories of your lives and a great bond with all other students who graduated this year. What lies before you now is a transformation into an adult, a collegiate scholar, a responsible young person who manifests the moral and cultural values you have learned from all of us so that you can make wise decisions. It is supposed to fill you with elation. You are supposed to be excited, happy, and proud of all that you have accomplished. But sooner than you can ever imagine, maybe even right now, these emotions are replaced with the reality of change, of struggle, a new awareness of competition and danger, and of the new challenges ahead. In the last decades, we have seen how the churches across America have gone from pillars of society to more inconsequential roles. The vast number of young people have left the church and have become the famous nuns, N-O-N-E-S, of demographic researchers. Online celebrities and secular textbooks alike conspire to make your family's faith and your Christian inheritance seem pathetic. Everyone wants to erase the deposit of culture and faith that you have received through the church. No matter how strong your faith is now or how bright your academic achievements have been, in a little while you will be challenged to your core and will have to develop new strategies for holding fast to the deposit of faith and morality that you have been imparted here in our church. You will struggle to apply life lessons, but have no fear. You have many guides and spiritual friends who will accompany you on this journey. You are stronger than you know. The world has become a bigger mystery as our knowledge of the world has grown. We know more about human nature and psychology than ever before, but our specialization means that simple human wisdom and healthy functional family relationships are now out of reach for the common man. College debt and globalization conspire to make jobs harder to find for young people. Less enthusiasm for marriage and changing values about children make young men and women much less likely to desire marriage and much less likely to have children once they are married. This leads to a rapidly aging society in which medical breakthroughs of science enable people to live to be older while expecting them to work less and leading to a crisis of identity, relationships, and lifestyle. As Alexander Solzhenitsyn so famously said in his Templeton Address, we hear a constant clamor for rights, rights, always rights, but so very little about responsibility, and we have forgotten God. Now is the time for selflessness, for a spirit of sacrifice, for a willingness to put aside personal gains for the salvation of the whole Western world. For thousands of years, simple narratives define the important moments of our lives and our connections with greater purpose. Now all of these stories have been torn down and replaced with facts, quote unquote, that are large bodies of recorded observations that our culture deems universally verifiable. All narratives have been rejected and replaced by words that represent political correctness. This ocean of technically unknowable information has led to the death of intuition and the human soul, leading to the nihilism of the postmodern world and the absolute depression of the Western inheritance. However, as we have drifted off into this deep ocean of facts, the detritus of the modern world has accumulated on the surface, the garbage of insincere politics and useless rhetoric, the outward plastic coverings of ideologies rising high upon the currents of mass media, creating islands where disenfranchised young people have pulled themselves back onto quote-unquote solid ground. Scientism and a blind faith in progress has replaced critical and scientific thought, and the search for truth has been supplanted by the superstitions of social certainty. All of the social justice movements that we now see elevated to religious status are just such islands of artificial surety, the result of purity spirals constructed from the flimsiest thinking and the most reactionary emotions. Not acknowledging universal human fallenness in the way that all groups use ideology and politics to hurt and oppress each other. Our side is good, your side is bad. All nuance or historical accuracy is thrown out the window to ensure that we look good for ourselves. We look into a mirror and immediately forget what manner of people we truly are. The answer of all injustice and all evil is true repentance and faith towards Christ, because in Christ there is no Jew or Greek, servant or master, male or female, but we are all one blood through the perfect, sufficient, finished work of the cross. Unlike here in our church, Western secularism over the last 100 years has been designed to uncivilize us in ways that are both aggressive and also insidiously effective. 
We understand human psychology and motivation like never before, and this information has been turned around upon us and used as propaganda and social control, not to make us more cultured, more civil, more able to think, and more nuanced in our decision making, but in order to capitalize upon our basest urges and make us unable to resist the most ridiculous advertisement and social media trends. The American culture and education system have been grossly abused to create consuming, selfish automatons who are broken into the smallest relational units possible by no-fault divorce, pornography, gaming, and radical feminism. The multi-generational family has fallen apart over the last 80 to 100 years as government policy incentivized factory labor over family farms. And the nuclear family fell apart over the last 40 because of radical individualism. Wendell Berry, the famous Kentucky farmer who is also a philosopher, wrote in The Unsettling of America, this is what has destroyed our way of life. Now the individual is under mental attack from smartphones, fast food, the gig economy, heavy debt, a lack of fulfilling marital and parental relationships, and the fear of having children. We have ended up an isolated, depressed, fearful, reactionary, angry mass, and now this confusion and disorientation is being channeled towards politics, socialism on the left, and radical racist and fascist ideologies on the right. The same forces that have dismantled the stable locus of the Christian family are now making us hopeful that the same system will bring about utopia. Rod Dreher says in his Benedict Option, ideology is the enemy of the joyful community, and the most destructive ideology is the belief that creating utopia is possible. No one seems to remember that the book Utopia by Sir Thomas More was satire, and that utopia in Latin literally means a place that cannot exist. We have nowhere to go but down in this uncivil society if it is not radically altered, and we do not change our course. What is the solution, you may ask? My honest opinion, the spiritual, communal, literary tradition of the Christian church, taken up by brave young people like yourselves. This tradition is ever ancient and ever new. It lives on in one generation of young people as they prove this truth into their aged years, and pass it on to more young people as they come up all over the world through the preservation and propagation of God's holy gospel. As Gustav Mahler so famously said, tradition is not the worship of ashes, but the passing on of the flame. This tradition, what St. Paul calls paradosis, is the teaching and learning, the receiving and passing on of lifelong learning and the love of community. It is truly stronger than we know. We hear many stories of Christians in ancient Rome, fed to the lions, slaughtered by gladiators, or hiding in the catacombs. We hear less about ancient Christianity in Persia under Shapur II, where even more brutal persecutions occurred. We think little of the persecution of Christians as they struggled for their faith in China, Korea, and Japan until recently, where believers were crucified, skinned alive, burnt with boiling oil, and tortured. The book Silence by Shusako Indo deals with the multiple ways that people were tortured in the early shogunate of the Edo period, leaving missionaries mentally broken as they were forced to see their converts slaughtered. Just last night, we talked to one of our friends in Japan who talked about the hidden Christians, or the Kakure Kirishitan, who kept their faith for over 400 years in absolute secrecy, quoting scripture and prayer in a closet, eating rice and drinking wine in a completely silent ritual of communion and passing on the faith by whispering into their children's ears, knowing full well that one childish indiscretion would lead to the martyrdom of the whole family. These Christians were much stronger than anyone knew. How do we deal with persecution when it really comes? The real kind, not the fake kind that we see on Facebook or hear about on Christian radio, where a teacher telling a student to put their Bible away during class is thought of as being paramount to, or equivalent to, being thrown to the lions. We have had the privilege of working with persecuted Christians over the last few years, both from the Middle East and from East Asia. And the thing that shocks all of us when we come into contact with these wonderful Christian brothers and sisters is that they are not persecuted in their own minds. They do not think that they have any disadvantage. Instead, they are more than conquerors in their own attitude. They believe that Christ's kingdom is swiftly returning and that they are not afraid to supplant, undermine, and collapse the system of the world and Satan in order to prepare for Christ's inevitable victory. Their lack of self-pity is invigorating and it is contagious. You start to see all the opportunities you have for subversiveness 
to divide and conquer and to challenge the world on its own turf. Secularism, communism, Islamism are all at a disadvantage because they do not reflect ultimate truth. As St. Augustine says, the human heart is not at rest until it finds its rest in Christ. What it requires is to come up against these worldviews in confidence of our own rightness, strength in the face of power, the ability to defer gratification and think on the wide arc of history. We personally may die, but God's truth goes marching on. There is literally nothing that they can do to stop us. We are stronger than we know. Over the last few years in East Asia, I have seen change unlike anything in the West. From multiple generations of buildings being torn down and built back up, to the huge swelling of Christian believers that have converted over the last two decades. East Asia has experienced the Industrial Revolution, the Digital Revolution, and the Sexual Revolution all at the same time. The changes have laid bare many of the motivations behind the same changes in the West, but which have been too subtle for us to completely comprehend. What I have learned about myself and my faith in this difficult situation is that one, I can do a lot more and adapt to more stressful situations than I could ever imagine. And two, it takes a lot more to knock personal faith out of you than you think. While it may seem hard, I have found many people who can survive and thrive as a Christian, even in an inhospitable environment, such as you find in an atheist country or on a college campus. This is why, upon my return to the West, I feel a certain amount of fragility and sensitivity that Christians here think is normal, but that I believe is the result of never really having to take a stand or fight for dear life. With this kind of entitlement, everything catering to our sensibilities, things that are small and should not phase us have become a big deal and ultimately cripple us. Not being able to meet for a few weeks makes us depressed. Having the government recommend that we close our schools and churches for a few months makes us feel alienated and think that we are on the brink of collapse and as if we are being persecuted by the local government administration. People see religious persecution everywhere believing that it is other people's job to make sure Christian rights are not trampled and that we have freedom of assembly, freedom of worship, freedom of belief, all the freedoms that we love and cherish. This expectation, however, is not the case all around the world. This is not normal. In fact, expecting to have this kind of freedom is abnormal. We live in a rare moment of history in the United States, one in which we can be Christians without consequence. But we should also remember that we will not always have such liberty, and we should prepare to that event. As we can now see from the rapidly secularizing and postmodern society, Christianity has become a sanctioned belief system. Talking about abortion, sexuality, family, or religion from a traditional Christian worldview can lead to the loss of employment and opportunity. I sat with a professor from one of the United States' most prestigious universities a few years ago. He was involved in admissions and interview work for his prestigious school. He readily admitted that he tried to screen out Christian homeschoolers and those who came from religiously conservative schools because these people were not seen as compatible with the brand of this famous institution. In the last few weeks, the news has been full of accounts of people losing their jobs for stating such obviousisms as men cannot have babies or trans women shouldn't compete in women's sports. These extremely simple and innocuous statements lead to mob lynchings and the loss of livelihood. There is increasingly intolerant and adamantly anti-Christian worldviews on the rise. Fragile Christianity will not survive. But we are much stronger than we know. We can learn, grow, change, resist, and pass our beliefs on to the next generation, even if our beliefs are extremely unpopular. It requires we cease expecting the outside world to act good and decent, it requires that we know that only Christians can truly act like Christians. The rest of the world is taken up by the demonic, the fallen, absolutely cruel, and the reality of kill or be killed. The civilizational reforms of Christianity are fading away, and we must realize that the beautiful inheritance that we have received from Christian morality and classical culture can only live on if they live on in us, internally, like it did within the hearts of the hidden Christians of Japan, the Jews in Catholic Spain, or the Persian Assyrian Christians under 1400 years of Islamic oppression. Our culture is already ruled by insanity. The kingdoms of this world have already shown that they desire to destroy Christ and his church. Good is called evil. Evil is called good. 
The basic truths that God established in the natural world to lead us to him are now invisible to us. The culture has become too self-focused to be able to see past our own artificially created and legislated realities. We wish to rule against things like whether sexuality should lead to childbirth, if gender and biology are truly connected, or if two men, two women, or an indefinite number of different people together in a group legislated as family can be the quote-unquote parents of a single child. Things will get worse before they get better. They will be more confusing before they get clearer. You will have to bravely stand for truth in perhaps the first generation in America who actually suffers for their Christian values. We cannot falter because it all seems so unfair. In many ways, this generation of Christians will be the saints and martyrs that define the next thousand years of Christian life. Today, as many of you remember the work of graduation, that day where we appreciate the fact that you are finished with a portion of your school. Let us remember what St. Peter says. For all flesh is as grass, and the glory of man is as the flower of the grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. Invest in the eternal. Lay up treasure in heaven, as Matthew 6, 19-21 says, and realize that there is a short amount of time for every one of you to do good. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believer in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. 1 Timothy 4, 12. God has shown us that we are to be ready for the challenges ahead. Be faithful. Do not fear what man can do unto you. Change the world as the world changes around you, by faith, hope, and love. Love is God, and God created the world, so love remakes the world and helps us to build a better and brighter future. Do not shy away from the uncertainties of life, but instead embrace all the uncertainties that are to come. Embrace them and follow after God, for he alone is the author and finisher of your faith. You, indeed, are stronger than you know. I've said this to you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.